So it is my pleasure now to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Lori Cooper Stoll. She's the executive director of the YWCA of La Crosse. Previously, she was a professor in the uh, Department of Sociology and Criminal Justice at UWL. Her research explores ways to dismantle systems of oppression. She is the author of two books, Race, Gen Race and Gender in the Classroom won the 2015 Distinguished Contribution to Scholarship Book Award for the Race, Gender, and Class section of the American Sociological Association. And her second book, Should Schools Be Colorblind? She has also published several book chapters and articles in peer-reviewed journals, and we are so happy that she is here today to talk about the YWCA. Welcome, Lori. Thank you, Deborah. Good morning. I, I was actually here before. It's been a while, but I was here in my other capacity as a professor uh, to talk about um, how to address colorblind racism. Um, while my talk may be different this morning, I'm going to promise you there are some themes running between both of these two worlds that I have inhabited. And I did not ask before, but if I give you the signal, are you going to change the slides? Is that how perfect? Um, okay, so as was shared earlier, to, to be clear, the mission of YWCA Lacrosse is to eliminate racism, to empower women, and to promote peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. I'm going to share a little bit of the history of YWCA with you this morning. Um, and talk a little bit about why the work we do is so important to our community. I, I will say, I oftentimes point out when I talk about the history of YWCA lacrosse, there's, it's impossible to not talk about the history of lacrosse because the two are so intertwined. This year, 2024, will be the 121st year that we have been in this community. Um, if you have ever confused us with YMCA, I hope to clear that up this morning. Full disclosure, I am a member of YMCA, but YWCA is different, and we like to say it's the W that makes all the difference. <laughs> so, um, so with that, um, the, one of the first things that I um, was made aware of when I came on board, lat, not this past February, but the February before, was that our organization had such a rich um, uh, archives at the main library. And that is all credit to the women who came before us who did an amazing job of uh, recording newspaper clippings, making scrapbooks, um, taking pictures. So there is no way to fully do that justice this morning, but I would be remiss if I didn't spend at least a few moments to point out some highlights because my, my goal is if anyone is here in person or in line and you have ever confused us with YMCA, that this will also help to kind of clear up what our trajectory has been, but it will intersect at least for a brief period of time with YMCA. I should also say on my first day of work with my very dear, dear friend sent me flowers. They were actually delivered to YMCA. So. <laughs> So I think that this, uh, this talk is important for, for many reasons, and perhaps that is one of them. But the story really begins in 1903, because that was when, in March of that year, that 15 women gathered in the home of Miss Lucy Hogan and began meeting as the Young Women's Christian Association of La Crosse. The organization began its first year with 372 members and $1,350 in cash. After needing to upgrade uh, meeting space, the group moved to its official uh, location, which was above Corrin's Dry Goods on, at 420 Main Street downtown. And at the time, classes were offered that included foreign language, sewing, mandolin, recreation, and Bible study. In 1905, the group moved to the Mons Anderson home. If you are familiar with it today, it operates as Le Chateau. Um, Renovations were made to the barn to create a gymnasium, and summer camps started being offered in 1905, where girls vacationed at a property at Eagle Bluff. 
By 1913, the local chapter of, had grown to about 1,000 members, and programs were booming. Now, during the World War I, um, the noon rest program that was offered at the time came to a halt because of inflation, uh, but many women shifted efforts to raise funds for the war, and due to increasing membership rates and the need for more space, the, the group then moved back to our downtown location um, so that we could rent the, third and uh, the second and third floors of those buildings. Membership with the Girl Reserves really boomed during World War I, and a number of other clubs and activities were added. Two evenings per week, women and girls were given free medical exams at no cost to them. In 1923, a roundtable club was formed and remained a very strong group for decades. In 1929, a number of card clubs were formed and began meeting. And in 1931, when it was no longer taboo to have mixed dancing, dance parties started being hosted by YWCA. At that time, in 1931, the organization purchased the Elsie Gal Scott Mansion, um, and the home provided a residence space for 30 women on the upper two floors. And the first floor was used for club meeting space and other administrative staff. The barn there was also converted into a gym, and the girl reserves occupied the whole third floor of the home. It was rented out to groups for weddings, receptions, teas, and uh, social events. And in these years, one of the largest programs was the donut sale. <laughs> but lawn parties at YWCA became annual programs, as well as an annual flower show that some of you may remember. And the Newcomers Club was formed with the goal to make space for newcomers to our city, to make friends, to have fun, and be in fellowship with others. And some of these members went on to be some of our staunchest supporters over the years. In 1947, Miss William Gerard started the nursery program, which became a flagship program of the organization. And many programs that had started in the late 30s continued on, but with some notable changes. So the girl reserves at that time became the Y Teens and the Y Wives Club was added. I gotta be honest, I don't really know what that is, but it was added during that time. And in 1953, we celebrated 50 years um, in, the, in the community. Um, at the same time, the uh, YWCA was outgrowing some of our space in the Elsie Gow Scott location, um, the YMCA was planning uh, making, on making some expansions to their space. And here's where this story um, intersects for the, for the first time. So under the recommendation of what was then known as the, known as the United Fund, we now know it as the United Way, um, two group, the, the two groups, YWCA and YMCA, began conversations regarding the idea of a joint facility. In 1963, uh, excuse me, the YMCA and YWCA boards began to cooperate, and a joint executive committee was created um, to raise funds for the new building, which is the YMCA, where YMCA is currently housed on, on West Avenue. Um, a outside a professional fundraising group was hired, and YWCA held an estate sale at our home, and the joint fund campaign kicked off in April of 1966. In 1969, the new joint YMCA-YWCA building was completed, and when the first two years of operation, memberships for both organizations soared. Uh, programs grew in capacity, and they grew in popularity. An expansion was completed in 1976 to make more room for programming, um, but it didn't accomplish some of the YWCA's goals at the time. Um, in 1977, representatives of the cross community gathered to start talking about how to help find solution for women and girls who were uh, escaping abusive household situations. And in 1978, the New Horizons Shelter opened uh, under YWCA Lacrosse. Um, it was also at that time we started offering programs as well um, for disabled persons in our community. If you can change, oh, we already changed the slide, perfect, okay. So after a name change and an update to our membership policies at Y, uh, or the membership policies at YMCA, YWCA decided to restructure our organization to better serve the community uh, when we get into the, the 1980s. Um, in 1983, the first annual tribute to outstanding women uh, happened in the community. And this was a way to elevate women's voices here in the lacrosse area and highlight the work of women in different fields in lacrosse. 
In uh, the fall of 1992, we sold our interest in the uh, YMCA building located on West Avenue and relocated to um, a building in on Alaska. And in January of 1993, that New Horizons program left the umbrella of YWCA to become its own nonprofit organization. So as you can see, over time, YWCA evolved from being an organization that offered, um, well, for, for many intents and purposes, um, social opportunities to, to gather. But I don't want to lose sight of the fact that even if you go back and look at the, the clippings and things from the 30s, 40s, 50s on, they were focused around issues of equity. And YWCA really evolved over the past several decades to become a social justice organization. And so in uh, 2008, we, uh, in partnership with the county, opened Ophelia House to keep nonviolent women out of jail by providing them with housing and help towards working, uh, working towards self-sufficiency through education and work skills. And we also adopted our current mission along with our national organization, which situates eliminating racism as the first part of our mission. Um, we adopted the Stand Against Racism campaign in 2007, and it became a signature campaign of ours in 2015. In 2021, if we can get to the next slide, I think we have, yes. In 2021, um, we celebrated 120 years uh, here in the community. In, um, uh, excuse me, in 2023. In 2021, um, we moved to the REACH Center at 212 11th Street South. Um, this is where the REACH program is housed, and we are one of the organizations that collaborates uh, as part of that program. If you're unfamiliar with REACH, um, the, the, um, the, the mission and benefit of it is that for our neighbors who are struggling um, with housing insecurity, with economic insecurity, instead of having to try to navigate multiple agencies, which is oftentimes where just creates additional barriers to those neighbors, that they can come in and in one location be able to um, uh, be connected with the other social service agencies in our community to help meet their needs. Um, okay, so there's a lot that's happened in the time that we've been in the community and our work continues. So today, if you can change that slide for me, there are essentially four major areas that we do work in. Um, some of these are um, programs that are particularly uh, common among other local YWCAs across the US and around the globe, and childcare is one of them, because here's the thing, in order for women to achieve self-sufficiency, women need to work. And if women are gonna work, they need access to quality, affordable childcare. Childcare is a crisis, and our lack of childcare is a crisis in our community and across the US. Our child center is located currently on the campus of Western Technical um, uh, Community College, and um, we have, committed to being one of the most um, affordable quality child centers in the community because we know what a need that is. Um, I could tell you stories of the phone calls that we get on a daily basis from families in this community that need child care. And let me tell you, it is also an economic development issue because employers often struggle being able to bring young families to our community when we don't have enough child care spots for them. I could do a whole talk just on this. So as you can tell, I'm very passionate about that. Okay, supportive housing as well. REACH is again one of those programs, but we continue to operate Ophelia House as, as a diversionary program to keep nonviolent women um, from, from being on the street, from not having a place to live. Um, but we also run a youth housing demonstration program for uh, folks in our community between the ages of 18 and 24 who are also struggling with a lack of housing. And we help to not only uh, help them secure housing, but teach them life skills to be able to be self-sufficient as well. Um, restorative practices and community education are also a core component of what we do. Now, community education uh, looks like providing uh, racial justice workshops in our community, which we have done for several years, but also workshops around other justice-related issues, too. 
Restorative practices is uh, uh, work that we've been doing in the school system here for a number of years, and I would like to um, kind of you know, wrap up with, with sharing a story about why I think restorative is such an important program for our community. So with the support of the United Way and the La Crosse Community Foundation, we started offering restorative practices um, at Logan and, and Lincoln Middle Schools in the 2015-2016 school year. Um, we recognize as an organization that exclusionary practices and exposure to the juvenile justice system um, was uh, ha had negative both academic and social consequences for youth in our community. And that ha often has a lasting impact over their lifetimes. So we wanted to, we wanted to um, work in partnership with others to be able to disrupt that school to prison pipeline. Um, with the support of the, the school district, Justice Circles was then expanded into Longfellow, uh, Longfellow Middle in 2019 and along with our high schools, both Lincoln and Logan and Polytechnic. So what do we do through restorative practices? Well, one of the many things we do is we train students to help them facilitate restorative uh, circle conversations. Um, we work with staff to help providing trains, training so we can create the infrastructure within our schools to support restorative practices. Many people assume that those practices are mostly reactive. So a harm has been done and then we go in and we seek to provide the skills and the supports and the accountability structures for youth to be able to work through that. But ideally, 80% of the work we do is proactive so that we don't get to that point. And we operate circles for all kinds of, there are all kinds of reasons we are asked to come in and do that. From everything from welcoming new students into the school system, um, to remediating harm that has been done, um, to also just helping to create a safe, welcome, and in, uh, inclusive environment in classrooms as well. And as I oftentimes say, I, I don't think that, <laughs> I mean, it, teaching youth communication skills, how to mediate conflict in healthy and safe ways. Um, the types of skills that developing, you know, leadership skills, watching some of these youth over the years now take on leadership roles in our community has been extremely rewarding. We also know that um, in the aftermath of the pandemic, that we have definitely seen an impact in terms of truancy and absenteeism within schools. Restorative practices help support students feeling connected to their schools. And even and while we are not there to provide mental health supports, I can tell you from experience and doing this work over many years, when students have ways to, again, safely and effectively mediate conflicts that they're experiencing, that improves their well-being and their sense of belonging within the school. And there's a, a quick story I will share about one youth in particular. Now, again, keep in mind that when we started this program, we were in the middle schools only. Uh, in my time on the, long before I knew I'd be in this role or having this conversation with you, I actually championed the expansion of restorative practices in our school district as a school board member because I knew how important this work was. So. There were students that we were able to form a relationship with at their time during middle school, but once they got to high school, we weren't there, at least until just a couple of years ago. So Tracy, our um, restorative practices director, um, uh, has, a, has a story that she shared about a student that she initially met when he was in the middle schools uh, here and was having some struggles around attendance issues. Um, he, his mom had become sick and eventually passed away, and this was one of this was a, the reason why he was struggling with ha with with being able to um, be at school and on a regular basis. Um, we were able to get him connected to restorative circles, and from his experience with the circles, he decided he wanted to be a circle keeper himself because he wanted to give back to other students. And this is what we try to equip students with, the skills to be able to carry on, I mean, carry on the work without us there. We are, we are guides to help schools effectively establish the, client, the climate to do this work themselves. 
Well, when we began Justice Circles in the high school recently, um, Tracy happened to run into this student um, a number of years later who ran up to her, threw his arms around her, and said, I've been waiting four years for you to get here. And in the time uh, that that had happened, um, he had also lost another close family member and was struggling again. But we were able to get him connected with the circles um, and help him get connected through there back onto the baseball team. He graduated and went on to college at Western. So we have many stories over the years how seemingly simple interventions can really change the course of a child's life. Now, to wrap up, let me say a few things. If you were one of the folks when we started who was like, you know, I don't really know a whole lot about YWCA, and now I hear they've been in the community almost 121 years, I'd like to suggest that there are reasons for that. Um, and the reasons for that follow the experience we know other historically woman-led organizations have had. We have not made it 120 years because we have deep coffers or financial reserves or endowments. We continue, like other social service organizations and nonprofits in our community, to seek funding every year to be able to continue the work that we do. And in the time that I have been part of this organization, there have been positions that I have had to eliminate, which were extremely hard to do, but we are not in a different situation than others. So I don't want to leave with the impression that the reason that we've made it is because of financial security. We've made it because of the women and the community members here who have worked hard to continue this good work. So I am very grateful for the opportunity to talk about that work with you. And if you do nothing else for me, if you will go back into the community and share some of the work that we do, if we can get to the last slide, I believe I have our website there, which I'm super proud of because we just had to update that last year. So you can check it out and get connected with the organization, either through um, uh, giving your time, giving your financial gifts. We certainly appreciate them. So I will stop for now. Thank you.